The best way I can say it is you are a murderer and you are a liar. Now, the jury didn't believe your lies, and now you're finally exposed for the selfish, murdering, lying monster that you are. This is Jason Harris, a 47-year-old serial murderer sentenced to life without parole. On December 10th, 2021, justice may have been delayed, but it is not denied. Yes, that's the correct statement for this case. The sentencing day was all about Harris trying to justify his innocence. But Judge David Newblatt had stern words for him. Addressing Harris directly, Judge Newblatt declared, The best way I can say it is you are a murderer and you are a liar. He clarified that the jury saw through the lies just as he did. The judge went on to expose Harris's motive, stating that he wanted to get rid of his wife to avoid paying support and gain control over their assets. What you wanted, all the stuff. You sacrificed your daughters. Right? You took away their mother. That's the first thing you did. You took away their mother. Christy Harris, 36, a loving wife and mother, tragically lost her life in 2014. Her death was initially ruled as an accidental overdose, but her family knew something wasn't right. They knew that Christy was not a drug user. What followed was a seven-year battle for justice. After years of determination, the truth came to light. Proof from Christie's breast milk proved that she had not ingested any illicit substances. Jason had laced the cereal he prepared with a lethal dose of heroin. The evidence led to the conviction of Jason Harris on charges of first-degree murder. Hearing the judgment, Christie's family, who had been waiting for this day for seven long years, found solace. Christie's sister, Patricia Hutchinson, expressed gratitude, saying, The judge said everything we wanted to say to Jason's face today. Christie Harris leaves behind two young daughters, Haley and Kellyanne. Knowing that their mother's killer will never pose a threat again, the family can finally have a sigh of relief. This is Gregory Green, a paroled murderer sentenced to 100 years in prison in July 2017. But while I stand up here trembling with fear, I put on my bravest face to be in the same room with the man who murdered all four of my children. Faith Green, the wife of Gregory Green, uttered these words at the time of final legal proceedings. In 2016, Gregory committed an unspeakable act, killing his two children and two stepchildren. The gruesome details of the case revealed a deliberate and premeditated plan. Green executed the two teenagers, Chadney Allen and Kara Allen, in front of their mother, who was bound and subjected to unimaginable torture. The other two girls, Coy Green and Kaylee Green, were poisoned with carbon monoxide from a car's exhaust in the family's driveway. The presiding judge, Dana Hathaway, expressed her utter shock at the severity of the crimes. She condemned Green's actions by emphasizing that fathers were meant to protect their children and husbands to protect their wives. Harris shared her heartbreaking experiences in court. She described how Green's behavior changed dramatically after the birth of their first child, becoming abusive and filled with anger. During the court proceedings, assistant prosecutor Tricia Girard highlighted the evidence of premeditation, pointing out Green's prior preparation for the murders. She mentioned his purchases from a Home Depot the week before, demonstrating that he had planned all these acts. During the initial trials, Harris, still grappling with the immense pain of losing her children, came in a wheelchair with her face covered. It was due to the beating she took by Green the day he murdered their kids. While announcing the final verdict, the judge delivered a powerful statement, assuring that Green would spend the rest of his life behind bars. She emphasized the gravity of his actions and the irreparable damage he caused to the lives of innocent children. 
he was sentenced to 45 to 100 years for his crimes. Therefore, sir, as to the charge of murder in the second degree regarding Kaylee Green, how do you wish to plead? Uh, guilty, sir. As to the charge of murder in the second degree as to Coy Green, how do you wish to plead? Guilty, sir. Next up is Peter De Koning, a man who ended up killing his friend and was sentenced to life in prison. Ronald Russo was stabbed to death in a blood-spattered mobile home in Lee's Trailer Park, Massachusetts, in February 2014. The gruesome details of the crime emerged during the court trial of Peter de Koning, the man stabbing Russo 69 times. Uh, further investigation, uh, the autopsy report revealed that Mr. Uh, Russo did suffer 69 knife wounds uh, to his body. As a prosecutor began explaining the gruesome details of the murder, Russo's brother, Thomas Russo, could no longer contain his emotions. Overwhelmed by anger and grief, he launched himself at de Koning. Chaos erupted in the courtroom as court officials struggled to restrain Thomas Russo. Witnesses reported that Thomas Russo blabbed these words as he was removed by force from the courtroom. One court officer even sustained injuries while trying to break up the brawl and had to be wheeled out on a wheelchair. During the trial, Peter de Koenig claimed self-defense and denied killing Ronald Russo. He argued that he was shot or stabbed in the calf during the altercation. However, his belligerent behavior and verbal threats against arresting officers raised concerns about his credibility. The crime scene was horrific, with blood spattered across the walls, ceilings, and furniture. Investigators discovered Rousseau's lifeless body still clutching a knife with a shocking 69 stab wounds. De Koning was apprehended near a train station, his clothing stained with blood, and he had cuts on his hand. De Koning was charged with first-degree murder and was sentenced to life. Thomas Russo, who attempted to confront de Koning in court, was charged with disrupting court proceedings and resisting arrest. After pleading not guilty, he was released on bail. The judge also ordered him to stay away from the defendant's family. The brutal murder of Ronald Russo and the subsequent courtroom chaos has left many in that region in mourning. These kinds of raw emotions are pretty evident during such criminal proceedings. This is Thomas Schmotzer, who got convicted for six years of crimes related to two counts of third-degree murder, fleeing a police officer, assault, and operating a vehicle. This chilling incident unfolded in a Tuscola County courtroom during a sentencing hearing, shocking everyone. On November 30th, 2021, as 38-year-old Thomas Schmotzer faced sentencing, tensions escalated to a dangerous level. After learning that he would spend at least six years behind bars, Schmotzer unleashed a series of threats toward prosecutor Mark Green. He also mouthed profanity and expressed his intent to kill. Judge Amy Grace Gearhart was already alerted of the dangers before the proceedings started. When she handed down the sentencing, she retreated to her chambers but could hear the disturbance from the adjoining courtroom. The situation escalated to the point where she had to go into lockdown for her safety. Statements about, you know, the intent to kill and that, that carried on for a period of time. In an interview, prosecutor Mark Reen expressed gratitude for the swift actions of those present during the scuffle. Still, he acknowledged that such a collection of individuals might only sometimes be there to defuse the situation. This incident highlighted the urgent need for increased security measures within the Tuscola County Courthouse. Judge Gearhart had been advocating for enhanced security, and this unsettling event only reinforced the necessity of her request. The safety of the staff, prosecutors, defendants, and all in the courtroom must be paramount. It's a funding issue for the board. It's a safety issue for me. It's a safety issue for my employees. 
It's a safety issue for everyone that comes and goes from the courthouse. This is Justin Ray, a sex offender convicted for nine years. These charges were due to child endangerment, sexual exploitation of a child, and misconduct. I'm willing to, you know, testify today and represent myself today, which legally under state law I'm allowed to. You're allowed to represent yourself, but we're not set for evidence today. In October 2017, the lifeless body of Jessica Montero Ray was discovered in a Kansas City hotel room. Her death circumstances were shrouded in mystery, with conflicting statements from her husband, Justin Ray. But what unfolded after her tragic passing was nothing short of horrifying. Justin Ray, a 26-year-old man, was sentenced to nearly nine years in prison on charges unrelated to his wife's death. He faced felony counts of sexual exploitation of a child and child endangerment. Ray's disruptive behavior led to his removal from the courtroom during the trial. He watched the proceedings via video link as the judge handed down his sentence. In addition to the prison term, Ray must register as a sex offender. Basically an O.J. Simpson case for something that's not proven nor even it happened. But let's rewind and uncover the shocking details that led to this gruesome discovery. Ray was arrested at a storage unit in Lenexa, Kansas, where he was found with two of his children. Ray had been preparing to transport his wife's remains to Arizona for a religious ceremony. What was shocking was Ray dismembering his wife's remains in a hotel bathtub, placing some body parts in a large cooler. Ray claimed he dismembered his wife's body based on religious beliefs, stating he couldn't leave her behind. However, his actions shocked the nation and led to further investigations into his past. Hey, that's enough. That's enough. I, I, don't, I don't care if it's enough because I have my children out there that her mother, their mother just killed herself. And you guys are kidnapped my children, our children, from their father. Investigators discovered photos on Ray's phone, unrelated to his children, that led to charges of sexual exploitation. There were photos of young teenagers naked with a lot of pornography. Ray is also charged with murder in the case of Sean Ty Farrell, a man from Palm Springs, California, who disappeared in 2016. Although Farrell's body has not been found, blood evidence was discovered in Ray's vehicle following an accident months after Farrell vanished. As the investigation continues, the disturbing actions of Justin Ray leave us with more questions than answers. Here is Michael Shane Bargo, another murderer facing the death penalty after killing a 15-year-old. Back in 2011, Bargo killed Seth Jackson by luring him into a home where his colleagues viciously attacked him. Bargo fatally shot Seth himself. The cruelty didn't end there, as his body was burned and the ashes disposed of in a water-filled rock quarry. A 15-year-old child knew he was being dragged back into a house and was going to die. During Bargo's conviction, a jury recommended the death penalty with a vote of 10 to 2. However, the Florida Supreme Court later ordered a new sentencing hearing due to the non-agreeable jury recommendation. Later, a unanimous jury recommended the death sentence which was imposed. During his court appeal, Bargo's attorney raised several issues, including the consideration of mitigating factors related to Bargo's mental conditions. He was not taking any medication for any of the mental illnesses that he had been diagnosed with. However, most judges rejected these notions. Justice George, however, had another view on this. He stated that the court should have ordered a comparative proportionality review. The colleagues that helped Bargo in this horrific crime were sentenced to life. During the conviction, Jackson's mother was seen as happy that his son's murderer was dealt with. According to the State Department of Corrections, Michael Bargo, now 29 years old, remains an inmate at Union Correctional Institution. 
He awaits his death penalty. The next criminal on our list is Shara Wright, who got 30 years in prison for assisting in her husband's murder. I am taking full responsibility for setting up the meeting on the 18th that eventually led to his death. During the recent court hearing, Shara Wright was denied the request for parole. The severity of the crime was cited as the primary reason for the denial. In 2019, Shara Wright was sentenced to 30 years in prison after entering a guilty plea for her role in the 2010 murder of her ex-husband, Lorenzen Wright. The former University of Memphis and Grizzlies basketball star's life was tragically cut short, and justice was sought for years before Shara's conviction. During the parole hearing, the board clearly emphasized that granting parole at this time would depreciate the seriousness of the crime and promote disrespect for the law. Shara Wright's guilty plea to facilitation to commit attempted first-degree murder saved her from a potential life sentence. Currently serving about four years of her sentence, she must serve at least 30% or nine years. She would have done less than half of that minimum if she had been granted parole. Lorenzen Wright, a talented NBA player, tragically lost his life with his remains discovered 10 days after he was reported missing. His murder had a profound impact on his family, friends, and fans. Billy Ray Turner, a co-defendant in the case, was convicted of first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder, and attempted first-degree murder, receiving a life sentence. Guilty of first-degree murder is charged in count one of the indictment. Count two, conspiracy to commit first-degree murder. Count three, criminal attempt first-degree murder. As Shara Wright's parole request is denied, the Wright family continues to seek justice for Lorenzen's untimely death. While the next parole hearing is years away in 2027, we will closely follow any updates regarding this case. This is Nathaniel Rowland, imprisoned for life after killing an innocent university student who mistook his car for an Uber. The judge during Roland's trial, who was convicted of killing Samantha Josephson, abruptly stopped Roland's mother after she claimed that her son was innocent. Now, I know as a mother, and a mother knows her child, I know my son didn't do this. This tragic story in Columbia, South Carolina, captured national attention and highlighted the importance of ride safety. Samantha Josephson, a 21-year-old University of South Carolina senior, made a fatal mistake after she entered a car, mistakenly thinking it was her Uber in March of 2019. Little did Samantha know that the man behind the wheel, Nathaniel Rowland, had sinister intentions. Prosecutors revealed that Rowland had activated the childproof locks in his car, trapping Samantha inside. She was never seen alive again. Her body was later discovered in remote woods 65 miles from Columbia with 120 stab wounds. The trial that followed revealed a shocking disregard for human life. Throughout the proceedings, Roland maintained his innocence, but the evidence against him was overwhelming. Blood matching Samantha's DNA was found inside Roland's car and on the knife believed to be the murder weapon. Cleaning supplies and Samantha's cell phone were also discovered in the vehicle, pointing to a desperate attempt to cover up the heinous crime. After a week-long trial, the jury reached a unanimous verdict. Guilty on charges of murder, kidnapping, and possession of a weapon during a violent crime. He is guilty of murder. He's guilty of, of kidnapping. He's guilty of possession of a weapon during the commission of a violent crime. On July 27, 2021, Nathaniel Rowland was sentenced to life in prison. The judge described Samantha's fight for survival and emphasized the sufficient trail she left for the jury to see the extent of Roland's depravity. Samantha's grieving mother, Marcy Josephson, delivered a heart-wrenching impact statement during Roland's sentencing. She spoke of the shattered dreams shared between a mother and daughter. 
Marcy expressed the anguish of closing her eyes and feeling the horrors Samantha endured at Roland's hands. As a mother, you worry and pray that your child will be safe, happy, and healthy. When she was sad, I was sad. When she was happy, so was I. Her dreams were my dream, and her death was my death. This is Douglas Christian, who got acquitted of murder while his defense attorney was sent to jail. Yes, you heard that right. Christian, a man with a lengthy criminal history, faced a murder charge after allegedly providing drugs to Mackenzie Pyre, intending to engage in non-consensual acts. Tragically, Pyre lost her life in a hotel room in March of 2015. Christian maintained his innocence as the trial unfolded, claiming he did not supply drugs to Pyre on the night in question. Yeah, I'm innocent. Did you supply her with drugs? Not that night I didn't. I never supplied her anyways. However, prosecutors argued that he was responsible for her death due to the drugs he allegedly provided. In a stunning turn of events, the jury found Christian not guilty of murder, but did find him guilty of three drug offenses. Surprisingly, the verdict reading was delayed when Christian's defense attorney, Anastasius Manetas, was not immediately present. When he arrived, the presiding judge exclaimed, You are in contempt. Either pay up $1,000 or serve 48 hours. Immediately, the attorney responded, Your Honor, when can I serve those 48 hours? The judge responded with, You can do it now. As a matter of principle, Manetis opted to serve jail time instead of paying a fine. Manetis's decision to serve jail time drew a lot of media attention and raised questions about the dedication of defense attorneys to their clients' cases. Next up is Nathaniel Brazil, who fatally shot his teacher when he was just 13, sentenced to 28 years in prison. This case is quite heartbreaking, and it shocked the whole U.S. community, also igniting a nationwide debate on juvenile justice. The case began when a 7th grader, Nathaniel Brazil, shot his English teacher with a 25 caliber handgun on May 26, 2000. The reason was Brazil demanded to see two of his female classmates. When his teacher, Barry Gruno, refused his demand, tragedy struck. Brazil shot Mr. Gruno in the face, ending his life right before his classroom door. Nathaniel Brazil, just 13 years old then, was quickly apprehended. He was bound to be charged with second-degree murder, a serious offense resulting in a lengthy prison sentence. However, the details surrounding the crime and Nathaniel's background raised essential questions about appropriately handling juvenile offenders. Court records revealed a troubled past, as Brazil had witnessed his mother being subjected to domestic violence from a young age. Despite these challenges, Nathaniel was described as an honor student, well-liked by his peers and teachers. Although his grades had been dropping, he had expressed feelings of being picked on by classmates and teachers. The decision to try Nathaniel as an adult sparked a national conversation on juvenile justice. Florida amended its laws in the 1990s, making prosecuting young offenders as adults easier. Brazil's case highlighted the harsh treatment of young criminals across the United States. There was a 14-hour jury deliberation. Brazil was also given a fake gun to check how he could pull the trigger. I was holding the gun in my hand. My finger was on the trigger. I was holding it with both hands, holding it kind of tightly, and that's when the gun went off. Who pulled the trigger? I did. Show us how it can go off unintentionally. Can you replicate or duplicate that for us in court this morning? What do you mean? Can you show us how it can go off without you meaning it to go off? Can you show us? How did it go off? That's what I can't understand what you're saying. How? I pulled the trigger, but I did not intentionally pull the trigger. Oh. Nathaniel Brazil was convicted of second-degree murder and aggravated assault 
Rather than receiving a life sentence without parole, he was sentenced to 28 years. This is Cleveland Clark, a 52-year-old contract killer who was sentenced to death on July 4, 2009. Death. When the jury read this word giving their verdict, Ray's father wiped away a tear, letting out a tremendous sigh. Clark mercilessly slayed Sparkle Ray, 22, a young mother just weeks after her wedding. Ray was murdered in her Union City apartment on April 26, 2000. For years, the case remained unsolved until a startling revelation emerged. Her marriage to Rajiv Ricky Ray, which was found to be the main motive behind her horrific killing. The central orchestrator of the murder was Ray's father-in-law, Chiman Ray, who was convicted in 2008. Prosecutors revealed that Ray, motivated by racial prejudice, believed that his son's marriage to Sparkle, who was black, disgraced their family. Cleveland Clark and two other men conspired with Chiman Ray to do the despicable act. It wasn't until a break in 2006 when Clinique Jackson, who had witnessed the murder as a teenager, came forward and provided crucial information. She revealed that Clark had strangled and stabbed Sparkle Ray in front of her helpless six-month-old daughter. Cleveland Clark's volatile personality was fully displayed during the trial and sentencing hearings. His outbursts and obscenities led to the dismissal of the proceedings on several occasions. All the unnecessary ranting and refusal to accept responsibility for the crime sealed his fate. The jury got to see the killer that Sparkle got to face, Kelly Hill. Sparkle's life was cut short by hate, racism, and social detriment. Let's join hands in excluding the filth of racism and strive for a more inclusive world. Thank you so much for watching. Please be sure to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel, and we'll see you in the next one.